Namaskar and uh, welcome to this uh, discussion on Afghanistan and uh, the problem of terrorism uh, which uh, does occupy a lot of minds and a lot of analysis on how uh, this uh, entire terrorism scenario is likely to unfold going forward. Uh, and we have uh, a, a fabulous panel today. We have uh, Dr. Lisa Curtis, uh, who is uh, with the Center for New American Security. Uh, she has worked in the American administration, is uh, an acknowledged expert on South Asia. So it's great to have her. We have Dr. Kamran Bukhari uh, of the Newslines uh, Institute uh, and uh, one of the most astute uh, observers of uh, the terrorism militancy seen uh, in this region, in fact, uh, much beyond this region as well. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Antonio Agustosi, who has been in Afghanistan, who, uh, uh, at least in my book, is most famous for a fabulous book which he has written on the um, ISKP. Uh, and it's great to have him on the panel. We have uh, uh, Dr. Shanti uh, uh, D'Souza, uh, who is with the Cotillia Public Policy uh, Institute, uh, and she's a professor out there, uh, somebody who has worked on Afghanistan extensively uh, and knows the place really well, so it's great to have her. And finally, uh, my colleague uh, Kabir Taneja, uh, who uh, is all things terrorism as far as ORF is concerned, uh, specializes on West Asia, Afghanistan, uh, but uh, has written a book on the ISKP uh, or the IS uh, in, in India. Uh, so it's great to have this panel. And uh, uh, my, my, the first question I want to put is to Dr. Curtis. And uh, it's a very simple question that, you know, after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, and, the, you know, the, the focus shifting to the Indo-Pacific, is terrorism... Uh, in a sense, out of fashion in the U.S. Is it an issue anymore in the U.S.? Uh, because uh, somehow we don't get the sense that the U.S. Uh, gives the same level of salience uh, to the issue of terrorism or feels the same level of threat from terrorism that it probably did uh, until a couple of months back. Well, thank you for having me today. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks to ORF. Uh, for the invitation. Uh, I think your question is a good one. I think the Biden administration would like to turn the page on terrorism. Uh, we know that President Biden uh, wanted to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan for, for a long time. Uh, but I think that the problem is that we continue to face the threat of terrorism, uh, not only in Afghanistan, other parts of the world as well. But Afghanistan is the place where Al-Qaeda and the Taliban develop their uh, close linkages. Uh, there's been intermarriage. Uh, you know, they've been uh, fighting together for a long time. So the risk of Al-Qaeda reemerging uh, as a, a potent uh, terrorist force in Afghanistan is real. And that is why the U.S. must continue to monitor the situation and what's happening. Yes, the Taliban is fighting ISIS-K, but uh, the problem is we know that al-Qaeda is just biding its time and would like to rebuild and still uh, is targeting the United States and its allies. It still has the same goals that it's had for the last you know, 30 years. So uh, it would be a mistake for the uh, Biden administration to think that it can simply turn the page on Afghanistan now that U.S. troops have been withdrawn. Uh, we tried that in the past. In uh, After the Soviets left, the U.S. did abandon Afghanistan, focused on other parts of the world, and eventually you had the path to the 9-11 attacks. So we've seen that movie before, and the Biden administration must avoid going down that path. And so the way forward is to continue to monitor the terrorist threats, uh, seek to engage the Taliban without recognizing it or providing uh, direct assistance to the Taliban. Of course, there's a humanitarian crisis brewing and the U.S. and other nations must seek to alleviate that, uh, but not legitimize the Taliban 
before they deserve it. And certainly uh, we've seen a lot of problematic behavior in terms of the human rights situation, but also we have seen no change in the Taliban's relationship to Al-Qaeda. But do you think, uh, do you think the humanitarian crisis, which is real, uh, no doubt about it, uh, is a sort of a backdoor uh, to engaging with the Taliban and perhaps granting them a degree of uh, de facto legitimacy, uh, if not de jure uh, legitimacy? Uh, uh, because that's the sense which one is getting increasingly. And, and that seems to be working fine as far as the Taliban are concerned. And there is no real disincentive uh, which is there uh, from the US or uh, most of its allies uh, to to dissuade or to make the Taliban change the course they are on? Well, I, I, I don't really agree. I think there are ways to help alleviate the humanitarian situation without going through the Taliban. In fact, we're already seeing it happen. The US has provided over 450 million in humanitarian assistance this year, more than any other nation. The World Bank just announced it's releasing 300 million to UN agencies to distribute both to the civil servants as well as um, directly to, to the people for humanitarian relief. So there is a way uh, to help with the humanitarian situation without boosting the Taliban or putting money in their pockets. Um, so I think that's possible. Um, and Again, I think it's important that we recognize that right now the hardliners are in the, the ascendance within the Taliban interim government. We see Haqqani leaders taking on major positions, and this is problematic from the United States perspective. Uh, the Haqqani uh, network is a designated foreign terrorist organization, so we simply cannot recognize that government uh, or, or fund it. And so I think the U.S. will remain um, firm in that position. And I don't see the release of this $9.5 in foreign reserves that are being held uh, in the U.S. I don't see that money being released to the Taliban. It's possible they could find a way to release it, uh, some of it directly to humanitarian organizations. But uh, I, I don't agree that because we have this humanitarian crisis, it means the international community has to recognize or start funding the Taliban. Uh, Kamran, you know, uh, shortly after the fall of Kabul, uh, you had written a piece in, uh, the, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, which I thought was one of the most interesting pieces I've read, where you said, uh, you know, that there is this huge disconnect uh, between what the Taliban are likely to do, because if they are pragmatic, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, they will have serious problems within their ranks. And if they remain ideological, then, uh, you know, they have serious problems with the rest of the world. Uh, and how they kind of balance this is really going to be very tricky. Now, uh, having said that, just to take this thing a little forward, one of the things which everybody is talking about or one of the conditions which everybody... Uh, is, is uh, actually wanting the Taliban to deliver on is that they uh, break their linkages with many of these terror groups or at least uh, rein in these terror groups, don't let them operate. And I mean, uh, you know, the Al-Qaeda, the TTP, all of the others. But when we see uh, the way things are operating in the Pakistan-Afghanistan dynamic, uh, what seems to be quite remarkable to my mind, and I want you to either agree or disagree or whatever you want to say, is that, you know, all those excuses which Pakistan used uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, to ward off the American pressure uh, for doing more on, uh, on, on curbing the Taliban activity, all those excuses that, you know, uh, there'll be a blowback and, uh, you know, you, you know the, all those excuses they were making are precisely the excuses that the Taliban now seem to be using uh, in uh, not uh, moving against the TTP. So how does this uh, thing move forward from here? What, where does it leave, uh, you know, the terrorism challenge which Pakistan is going to face from the TTP? And we are already seeing a spike in that. 
Well, thank you for having me, Sushant. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy that ORF put together this, uh, this wonderful panel so we can have this conversation. To answer your question, um, look, it's going to be very tricky. Uh, and I think I alluded to this point in that piece that you referenced, is that uh, right now um, the Taliban have an issue, and, and that issue has to deal with, so what is the future of all these foreign fighters who are not Afghan? who are Arabs, Central Asians, Uyghurs, Pakistani, and others. So, and, and we don't really have a good map. And, and, and it seems to me uh, from a distance that a lot of these elements are somewhere between ISIS-K and this Taliban nexus, which includes AQ that Lisa talked about. And so the, the question is, what do the Taliban do with these people uh, until there was an insurgency and they were fighting to come to power, uh, it was, you know, one could see why the Taliban would not abandon them or distance themselves from them because they needed that force multiplier effect on the battle space, uh, in the battle space. And so now uh, the question is, are they just going to have like refuge there? Surely these people are not going to be just sitting there and enjoying the hospitality of the Taliban and not pursuing their own political objectives. Uh, and so, and this is more so for the Pakistani Taliban rebels, the TTP, because from their point of view, the intra-Taliban, you know, Pakistani Taliban, Afghan Taliban conversation is, uh, at least from the Pakistani Taliban side is, well, you guys have your emirate now. So, you know, how can you stop us from pursuing the same objective on the other side of the border. Um, and, and, and to even take that further, uh, you know, I've been arguing that the, the, the Islamic Emirate 2.0 uh, cannot survive in Afghanistan uh, in its current shape or form uh, if there is a strong Islamic Republic of Pakistan and vice versa. The Islamic Republic is actually exposed to the Taliban penetration uh, from, uh, you know, the other side of the border. And so the Taliban, I don't think that they have, and especially at a time when magnetism and that ideological commitment, I don't think that they can afford to put these people under lock and key. And we're just talking about the TTP. We, we can talk about the other fighters, foreign fighters that are there, uh, minus ISIS-K, uh, because ISIS-K is sort of an alternative for these elements. And what we're what the Taliban fear is that if they don't come up with an appropriate balance between the two, they could lose these people to ISIS K, and many of them have already gone over. A lot of former Afghan Taliban, TTP, and others are part of ISIS K, uh, and so again, it goes back to the point that I made in the piece. You know, how do you find that sweet spot between pragmatism so you can do business with the world? Uh, and yet at the same time, don't start to sort of implode from within. Um, and, and, and this is basically what happens. I mean, you look at the de-radicalization literature, it basically says that the biggest challenge for a group that wants to uh, become more pragmatic is to keep internal coherence, is to maintain that coherence, maintain the respect for the leadership. And in fact, uh, the, the risk is that the leadership could, could conflict with itself. And we're already seeing sort of those fault lines uh, between, you know, the, the, the Doha Taliban, if we can use that phrase, you know, around Mullah Brother, who dealt with the, the United States uh, and, and, and have traveled through the world. And then, of course, the field commanders, the people who wield the guns and the real power uh, in different parts of the country. So th I, I don't see... Uh, the Taliban being able to, maybe they can prevent, you know, anything like a 9-11 or uh, they won't turn a blind eye to groups trying to, you know, stage attacks, plot attacks against, uh, you know, other countries. But there's no way that they can just sort of say, well, you know, we're going to hand them over to their home countries or even put them in jail because that really would undermine the movement at a point when it's really vulnerable.
So two things come out here, Kamran. Uh, one, if they don't take those actions, and like we are seeing in the case of Pakistan, uh, that you know there is. Although I think this will go through that cycle that there'll be attacks, there'll be talks, there'll be attacks. Uh, they'll keep jostling for space. Uh, but how does the Taliban reconcile uh, these mounting attacks uh, uh, with you know the demands that are going to come uh, from the Pakistanis on them? And secondly, and more importantly. You know this ideological versus pragmatism debate, and you know uh, the Islamic Emirate versus the Islamic Republic uh, debate. Uh, you, we've just heard something from Zabiullah Mujahid recently uh, on on the system in Pakistan. How, where do you place that particular comment? Where do you think that was coming from? Do you think it it it's a portent of things to come, or uh, is it just one of those things you know which happened? I mean, I'm not surprised by those comments from Zabiullah Mujahid and, you know, other senior Taliban uh, uh, who've, you know, really bitterly criticized and, and, and uh, denounced Pakistan and its political system and saying that it lacks Islamic legitimacy. Um, you know, this is, isn't surprising because, as I said, the Islamic Emirate cannot exist next door to an Islamic Republic uh, because there is that inherent tension. Um, I think this is what the Taliban have all along deeply believed, uh, and they've just been, uh, yes, they've been a proxy of the Pakistani state, uh, but as we've seen in other parts of the world, uh, state-sponsored proxies, uh, once they, you know, uh, become more mature, have more longevity, they develop other relations, which is what is happening with the Taliban, they don't really feel the need to be beholden to their primary sponsor uh, or, or, you know, or their erstwhile sponsor. And that's happening with Pakistan. Um, and there's another interesting dynamic that we uh, were seeing come out, which is that the Taliban uh, are, uh, are criticized by non-Taliban or anti-Taliban Afghans, and there are a lot of them. And the, the biggest sort of a stick that they have to beat the Taliban with is that you are pursuing a Pakistani agenda, your proxies of the inner services intelligence, the ISI, and uh, you're not an Afghan movement. So how does the Taliban now uh, counteract that? And this is one way where you come out deliberately and criticize uh, the, the Pakistani state uh, but I'm not saying that this is for information operations purposes. This is also a, 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 a view, a, an ideological view, and it's also necessary uh, from an interest point of view because um, uh, the, right now, you know, there's a natural thing that's ha happening. So there are supporters of the Taliban in Pakistan who want to emulate the emirate. Likewise, uh, the Pakistani state is trying to pull the Taliban towards a more pragmatic, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, user-friendly type situation. And they, and this is the tussle that's going on. It'll go on for quite, this explains why the Taliban are coming out and saying, well, we really don't recognize uh, the, the boundary between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, because they're trying to now appropriate the Afghan nationalist mantle. Ironic for Pakistan, that the whole idea of supporting first the Islamist insurgents in the 80s against the Soviets, and then since the 90s, the Taliban, was to sort of find strategic depth on its Western flank and make sure that, you know, we don't go back to the, well, you know, we don't recognize this boundary and there are Pashtuns on the other side of the boundary and here. And so uh, this is the entire purpose of having these proxies. And now you just see that it's that entire purpose blowing itself up. Just a very quick follow-up on this particular issue. Do you see uh, this kind of a statement which has come and there are other people who are making these kind of statements against the ISI and all sorts of other people are making these statements. Uh, do you see this uh, remaining purely at the level of statements and tensions which come because of the kind of statements being made? Or do you see uh, this possibly in the future... Uh, becoming something uh, a little more serious, perhaps even more kinetic uh, going forward? 
I do see it going kinetic, and, and that is the biggest risk. Uh, at the level of the leadership, they're politicians. And, and so they will say, you know, one day they'll say things against Pakistan because that's sort of due at that moment. The next day they'll, they'll go back and because they're, uh, you know, in talks with the Pakistanis. Pakistan is still sort of their gateway to the outside world, even though they've developed relations with Qatar and now the Central Asian states are uh, interfacing with them as, as well as the, uh, the Chinese and to a lesser extent the Russians. Uh, but they, on the, in, the, uh, in the background, um, it's about command and control. So, you know, I, I really doubt that there is enough command and control uh, by, on the part of the leadership that they can not, uh, you know, see this thing getting kinetic, transforming itself into kinetic operations, the, these views then leading to action. And it's already, we're already seeing some of that. Uh, the TTP is based in Afghanistan. Everybody knows that. The Pakistanis say that. Uh, yet they're attacking in Pakistan. And so uh, the Taliban, uh, you know, what are they doing? They It, sh it shows both a lack of willingness and even, I would argue, capability to rein them in. Dr. Gustozi, uh, you know, you've written a fabulous book on the ISK. In fact, it's it's the go-to book for most people uh, who are looking at the phenomena of ISK. Uh, but do you think that, uh, you know, after the Taliban have taken over power in Afghanistan, uh, it is now a case of the good Taliban versus bad ISK. Uh, because, you know, somehow that seems to be the impression which seems to have been gaining ground. In fact, uh, uh, a lot of countries actually, even before the Taliban took power, were supporting uh, or lending a degree of support to the Taliban uh, on the grounds that the ISK was a bigger danger than the Taliban. Uh, do you really think that uh, that is the case? And do you think that the ISK, while one understands that uh, they have a potential for a, uh, for creating a lot of murder and mayhem inside uh, inside uh, Afghanistan, uh, but do you really think they have the potential to actually exude the sort of uh, you know uh, terrorism which they did in the Middle East? Uh, in uh, sitting in Afghanistan. Do you think there is that potential going forward? Well, um, of course, you know, good and bad, uh, uh, it all depends, you know, from which perspective you look at uh, the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, if uh, uh, ISK is seen as a threat, and I think certainly in the region, it is seen as a threat, uh, in general, China, Russia, Iran certainly converging this, I think uh, increasingly also Pakistan. So for them, I think all of these countries see, uh, and also the Central Asian countries in general, they see uh, ISK as a problem, and most of them, perhaps not all of them, but most of them also see the Taliban as the only option in terms of containing or if not destroying uh, the Islamic State in Khorasan. Uh, that their perspective from the point of view uh, of the Americans or the Europeans, uh, I think right now the Islamic State of Pakistan doesn't have the capability and probably doesn't even seek the capability to strike at long distance. Uh, the situation today is very different from the situation in 2001, uh, mainly because now we have big uh, uh, strongholds both of Al-Qaeda and ISK in other parts of the world, uh, not just in Afghanistan. So you have still a presence in Syria, though that has been contained, but they are still, uh, I mean, the Americans still carry out strikes regularly inside Syria uh, against uh, alleged uh, Al-Qaeda targets. Of course, they have a very strong presence in West Africa in a number of places. We know that there is a very strong underground presence uh, in Turkey, you know, which has become the financial hub central of the Islamic State, uh, but also Al-Qaeda clearly as a presence and elements linked to Al-Qaeda. You've got other groups that uh, are neither Al-Qaeda now nor Islamic State, like Ayat Tahrir al which are still considered to be 
uh, international terrorist groups, for now at least, uh, and, and so on and so forth. You know, so basically you have uh, uh, a situation where any of these groups as alternatives, they don't need Afghanistan in particular. Certainly if you want to strike uh, Europe, why would you, you know, create capabilities in Afghanistan with places when you have people in Turkey, probably also a considerable number of Turkish citizens with Turkish passports who can enter Europe uh, very easily. If you have uh, a presence in the Middle East, in Africa, along the routes that take migrants to Europe, you know, why would you need Afghanistan at all? And and from the American point of view, things are more complicated. They are, they are in a better position, certainly, to uh, prevent infiltration. Uh, but still, you know, nobody particularly in Afghanistan to strike at America. I think the main value of Afghanistan from the point of view of these uh, organizations is that any attack that might take place in America in the future uh, could be claimed to come from uh, Afghanistan, even if it didn't. You know, even 9-11 really didn't need to uh, be organized at all from Afghanistan. You know, the issue is that after all that happened, after 9-11, after 20 years of war, it would be very embarrassing for any American administration if there was even a claim that an attack in America had something to do with Afghanistan, regardless of the reality on the ground and regardless of whether Afghanistan had a necessary role in this, you know, because in the end of the day, it is immaterial whether an attack comes from Afghanistan or Turkey or Syria, as long as there is a range of options for terrorist groups, it doesn't particularly uh, make any sense to focus on only on one. You know, why we worry about Afghanistan when, you know, should be more worried, I think, about Turkey, really, you know, at least from an European perspective, but not only. Uh, the presence of these groups underground in Turkey, the financial hubs, they are much more worrying, I think, than whatever happens in Afghanistan at this point. For the, for, with regard to the second part of your question, um, the potential of ISK, uh, if you mean in terms of international terms, I already answered, in terms of the, um, uh, the relation with the Taliban, um, I think the potential of representing a threat for the Taliban Emirate is a potential. I think the issue is the, uh, you know, whether they can mobilize, especially the financial resources necessary for mounting a serious threat. For right now, for the Islamists in Khorasan is still largely, uh, primarily an issue of survival. I think the, the thinking, and might be right or wrong, is if they don't destabilize the Emirate now, in spring, the Taliban will go on the offensive and they will be in a position to crush them, uh, whether alone or with some help. And they think that the Americans might, in the end, help the Taliban, not officially. You know, I don't think that there is any possibility of any open coordination between uh, the, the Americans and the Taliban. But unofficially, like it happened in the past, airstrikes at the right time, right place, could certainly help uh, the Taliban a lot in attacking uh, the main basis of the Islamic State in Khorasan in the East, because the Islamic State in Khorasan uh, needs to have some safe haven somewhere for the leadership to operate, for the financial system to remain operational, for training, they need some admin. And these bases, which don't occupy a very large space, but they are in the upper valley of Kunar in Nuristan, these bases are very difficult to take for the Taliban with uh, infantry assaults. So, you know, uh, airstrikes, whether done by the Americans or now the Islamic State also believes the Russians might at some point do something like that, that would be very helpful for the Taliban. It might not even be acknowledged. The Russian would certainly be able to do that without even acknowledging them or could not be acknowledged as a form of cooperation. You know? So maybe it doesn't happen, probably it doesn't happen, but the Islamic State is certainly worried because that would mean the end of the Islamic State. You know, They've been through that before. They've seen what it means to have some kind of coordination between American airstrikes and Taliban light infantry in Achin, in Angahar in the past, in Kunar in the past. They, they, that, those were the first really decisive defeats suffered by the Islamic State. And they know that they can resist this type of operations. So I think the concern now is not, you know, all striking far away from home. The concern is surviving. Then, if they're able to survive, if we're able to create an environment where the Islamic State could consolidate a, a, a safe uh, haven of some description 
in the east of Afghanistan, they might change, you know, they might develop their appetite for uh, something more complex, central at the regional level. But right now, I don't think they have um, neither the appetite nor capability for doing that. Can I ask you a quick follow-up? There are, there are these reports which are coming in of elements of the uh, Afghan National Army uh, actually uh, making common cause with the Islamic State. Uh, how credible do you think these reports are? Do you think it's possible uh, or do you think these, this is probably just some amount of disinformation, misinformation which is taking place? Well, there is some evidence and some recruitment is taking place. We identified some people who joined. Uh, you can see on social media something is going on. I don't think we are talking about, at least for now, big numbers. Uh, and the, the, the nature of this recruitment is, is to be assessed. Uh, I think uh, mostly this is kind of mercenary recruitment. The Islamic State is insisting that people join with the equipment, they're only targeting former special forces to join because they know they have better equipment, especially optical equipment. They are they are seeking that, um, and uh, uh, they you know the purpose of this recruit is not to carry out the kind of operation that are now highlighted in the media, like target assassinations or or, or, or suicide attacks or, or, or car bombs, but I think they are for, or considered to be used to mainly in terms of protecting uh, Islamic state assets in the mountains, because there's going to be more conventional war when it comes. You know, there's been already, you know, one of the areas where this cooperation is reported at the tactical level is in Badakhshan, where the Islamic state is preparing for a Taliban onslaught in, in spring. You know, they have dismantled the main base in uh, Kastak Valley uh, in Badakhshan. They replaced that with a, a large number of small outposts. You know, so clearly they are preparing themselves for some kind of big assault. Uh, there are reports confirmed by Russian sources of intelligent cooperation between Russians and Taliban in, in the area. Uh, so the Islamic State, whether it's aware of that or not, believes that Badakhshan in particular is at high risk of a, some kind of cooperation between the Russians and the Islamic State. And of course, the Russians are particularly concerned about the Islamic State uh, near the Central Asian border, less about Bases, you know, in the east. Um, so I think they, they that kind of kind of tactical cooperation, mercenary uh, recruitment, that seems to be taking place, not on a very large scale, but um, you know they are offered money, and many of these uh, former servicemen have no no revenue. They are in hiding; that they don't have jobs. They're not able to leave the country, uh, and and they are they think that the Taliban are after them anyway. So that gives them some incentive for cooperation. Dr. D'Souza, uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that has been troubling a lot of analysts is that the victory of the Taliban uh, will have enthused, uh, you know, uh, people with a jihadist mindset or jihadist groups, uh, especially in the region. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk of that. But mm -hmm. in your own assessment, uh, have you seen any evidence of this happening? Uh, you know, uh, is there any chatter that you are picking up? Is there any uh, signs that you are picking up that, yes, indeed, uh, there are groups uh, in India uh, also, including Kashmir, in, in other parts of India, uh, in, in, in Bangladesh, in, in Afghanistan also, in, in Pakistan. Are you sensing uh, or are you picking up anything uh, which leads you to believe that indeed uh, there is uh, this factor which is coming into play in a big way. Absolutely. I think uh, the capture of power by a terrorist group like Taliban has uh, sent a signal to other groups in the region. And it's going to act as a force multiplier, uh, just not in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, but also in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa and other theaters at large. Now, if you look at particularly of what it means to India and the uh, in Afghanistan, uh, which are anti-India, that is the Lashkar Mohammed, uh, there has been a amount of activity which has been occurring, especially around provinces in Kunar and coast. And uh, you do get to hear from uh, friends in Afghanistan that this has picked up. So the one is the 
entire idea of a victory for a terrorist group, which has given them the space to operate. Second is their linkages with this other groups, which has, which will help the, these groups to carry out activities uh, much beyond the borders, that is beyond Afghanistan and Pakistan, and thereby will have implications for India. And lastly, is also it's become a melting pot for a lot many international terrorist groups, and uh, you see a lot of activities with ETIM, uh, Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, and other uh, other such groups which are associated with the Taliban. So I think uh, what we hear and what we know is definitely going to be worrisome uh, for the region, particularly for India. And uh, we did see this kind of ingress occurring when it, in the 1990s with Kashmir. You might argue now that Kashmir is a different scenario, but the fact that radicalization occurs at various levels uh, and the effect it has in terms of the victory and the occupation of space and the idea of actually capturing power will embolden a lot many groups. And we did see this a uh, couple of years back in theaters like Philippines. So uh, if you look at India particularly, we, we do see a kind of incidence in terms of the rise of radicalization, which occurs uh, even in this, uh, affluent states in southern India like Kerala. And thereby, we do see that this kind of scenario being played out uh, is a huge probability for India, which I think India has to take cognizance of. Yeah, so, so yes, so we have to take cognizance of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, as of now, at least in the last four months, uh, even if we've heard some chatter, uh, is there any sign that, uh, you know, uh, of any kind of movement which has been taking place either from Afghanistan into India or from some of these uh, groups uh, making a beeline towards Afghanistan. You know, we saw that in the past that some of these guys from India had gone to Afghanistan and then made common cause with the ISK. Uh, uh, are we seeing something like that or is it it's just too early right now? I think it's a bit too early, but the signs are evident. If you look at uh, the kind of movement it's occurring in terms of these groups, uh, particularly their nexus with organized crime and the rise in the narco trade and the funding which will go into such kind of activity. As you know, uh, Afghanistan has again spiked in the production of uh, drugs and huge consignments of those drugs have had reached India. And thereby there is a problem area here because this nexus is just not between uh, the Taliban and the terrorist groups, but also with the organized criminals and the smuggling. And thereby we have a huge political economy of conflict and the nexus will be difficult to break at one level. And secondly, it will sustain by itself given the financial inputs it gets from the narcotic trade. And lastly, I think even if you don't see the movement now, but the signs are ground and since uh, most of our observers uh, don't have the ears on the ground and actually do not uh, get to the chatter where it occurs we fail to see that moment till it becomes a little too late kabir uh, you know you've been looking at iran you've been looking at central asia you've been looking at the entire dynamic in this region uh, but when you compare uh, with the kind of uh, you know uh, the kind of outlook which both Iran as well as the Central Asian states have towards the Taliban in 2021 compared to what it was in 1996. Uh, there seems to be a world of a difference. Uh, there doesn't seem to be that level of apprehension regarding the Taliban, what was there earlier. We've seen some kind of deals being worked out between the Hazaras and the Taliban. Uh, I don't know whether... Uh, the, 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 these these deals will sustain for any length of time. Uh, I don't see how uh, you know uh, millennia old problems uh, of sectarianism are likely to disappear in just a couple of months. Uh, but uh, what are you what are you picking up as far as Iran and Central Asia, especially Uzbekistan and Tajikistan? Even between those two countries, we see a different uh, kind of an approach towards the Taliban. The the Tajik seem to be a lot more wary of the Taliban, uh, uh, and the Uzbek seem to be a lot more bullish on the Taliban. Uh, what's your assessment of how uh, these three very important uh, countries are likely to uh, see the situation unfold? Yeah. And what are they? What are they anticipating? 
Yeah, thanks, Sushant. Uh, look, it's it's been a very uh, uh, melting pot of views on how to deal with the Taliban and the coming of the Taliban again in Kabul, as far as Iran and the Central Asian states are concerned. Uh, now, of course, there is diversion between how Uzbekistan is approaching it and how Tajikistan is approaching it. Uzbekistan has been fairly, uh, uh, comparatively at least, forthcoming in dealing with the Taliban, seeing them as sort of a reality that is on their doorstep at this point of time. And Tajikistan is, of course, maintaining uh, its uh, uh, a level of its historic view of, of the Taliban and, you know, uh, maintaining distance and, and uh, also being host to some of the uh, uh, former officials that were in Kabul uh, at that point of time uh, when the Taliban came in. So I'll just get to that in a bit. But let me just start with Iran, because I think Iran is a, a player that is not discussed enough. Uh, on, on, on what is happening in and around Afghanistan. And I think it's very important because, um, look, there is a very small time lapse between think is between strategic thinking done by Iranians and the operational aspect of that strategic thinking by the Iranians, right? So by the time we are trying to assess what they're going to do, they've already gone ahead and done so. And that is largely because, you know, it's, it's, it's an aspect of being a survival state. They've been under sanctions. They have a lot of foes from their own perspective uh, in and around the region and around the world. And they see their their strategic interests as being paramount to uh, compared to anything else. And that is why I think, you know, over the past many years now, the Taliban have been supporting both the the the, uh, the uh, ecosystem in Kabul and the Taliban alike. So they have been, you know, supporting both of them side by side because just as as insurance policy that if one goes south, they have the other to bank on. So uh, you know, even when the Taliban came into the fold, we saw that uh, they were sort of these, uh, as you you know, as you mentioned, these bridge building, um, uh, uh, the, these bridge bridge building talks. At least I won't say they were deals per se uh, of. Uh, of uh, a Taliban outreach to the Hazaras, you know, the, during Ashura, there there were videos of the Taliban uh, providing security to the to the Hazaras, which is contested, by the way, by a lot of people on the ground on what they were actually up to, uh, and uh, uh, and you know the the Taliban wanting sort of good relations with Iran because it is important for them to also have have a consistency on their borders. Uh, but the interesting part here is, of course, that when the sort of interim cabinet was announced, one of the most visceral responses to that cabinet came from Tehran. You know, the first call that went out of Tehran uh, to uh, sort of uh, uh, push back against the names that were proposed uh, was by the Iranian foreign minister to to uh, Hamid Karzai, if I remember correctly, and not to anyone in the, in the interim cabinet. So that shows you that there is a level of... Uh, uh, conflict within uh, uh, between uh, the Ira Iranians and the Taliban on what constitutes as a as a wholesome uh, a cabinet uh, going forward. So uh, that's you know that's that's a critical part of how it's going to play out between the two between the two uh, 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 well neighbors. Uh, and I have to also remember that the, the you know the Iranians have the Fatimiyun Brigade. Uh, inside Afghanistan, a whole bunch of trained people that have, you know, uh, uh, they seem to be operating pretty much under the radar for now. Yeah, so that, that's the thing, right? So they are, and that's an availability, right? So they're not operating right now because the, the, the Iranians don't want an outright sort of hostile, hostile uh, environment with the Taliban at this point of time. Uh, but that that is an option, you know. The Fatimiyun, they, they've they've uh, they've fought for the Iranians against Islamic State in in Syria and uh, and and uh, you know neighboring areas. So uh, how that is going to play out, if required, is something that is uh, that is yet to be determined. But if you have to just uh, remember here that you know Iranians are very uh, uh, whether we like it or not very realistic uh, uh, when it comes to their aims and and uh, 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 requirements. So it is not to be expected that they will go all gung-ho uh, just to protect uh, the Shia Hazara minorities in Afghanistan. They'll take a much more pragmatic position. They'll make sure that their borders are safe. They'll make sure that the Taliban gives commitments to uh, not too many refugees going into Iran from Afghanistan and so on and so forth. Uh, instead of just, uh, you know, uh, uh, keeping the Hazara question on, on the pedestal. So that's, uh, and finally, just one more point on Iran before I uh, make one final point on Central Asia, is that you know, uh, 
one of the least discussed parts uh, about Iran and Afghanistan is the fact that Iran and Pakistan don't have a very cordial relationship. A lot that happens between the two countries happens behind closed doors and happens clandestinely, which gives an illusion that, you know, they may not be on very good talking terms, but they're not um, uh, 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 breathing down each other's necks uh, when it comes to issues such as Afghanistan. I think they do do that. So that is something that is also to be played out in, in the coming time. Uh, and we don't know how that's going to, uh, uh, what kind of results that is going to yield. Uh, and you know, finally, on Central Asia, uh, again, uh, it's it's uh, uh, almost all of them have come out with a level of uh, 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 acceptance of the Taliban. Uh, you know, Tajikistan is their acceptance is that okay, fine, they're there. We are going to keep a distance and and a level of our historic sort of stance against the Taliban. And those picks, for example, have been much more um, uh, forthcoming. But as we have heard recently, you know, there have been even um, uh, uh, unconfirmed reports of fighting between the Taliban, uh, Uzbek Taliban and other Taliban in, in the Faryab province, uh, uh, where uh, there are also unconfirmed reports saying that many Uzbek Taliban actually joined the Islamic State as, uh, as again, once again, insurance policy. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of dynamicism right now. And which is why, uh, just as a final note, you know, the most important and critical thing for the Taliban right now is internal cohesion and, and everything else comes after that. So they'll do whatever is required of them to make sure that internally they do come to a level of uh, stability, if you may, where their own sort of trajectory, political trajectory inside Afghanistan is not challenged. Dr. Curtis, uh, I, you know, something which uh, Dr. Gustozi said uh, is something which I want to raise uh, with you. One, uh, you know, when he talks about that, we might just see some kind of American intervention uh, going forward, uh, targeting the Islamic State. Uh, it'll not be acknowledged, but it'll be there. Uh, and that will kind of, in a sense, help the Taliban. Uh, but my question is, uh, why should the Americans do it? Uh, why not just let the Taliban and the Islamic State fight it out and kill each other? The second and somewhat related question is that uh, what disturbs me quite a lot is that there is just so much focus. For example, Dr. Gustozi said about, you know, the Russians could also be targeting the Islamic State. Uh, uh, everybody's talking about the Islamic State. In this entire narrative that is being built, Al-Qaeda seems to have been forgotten. Even though, uh, if you look at the kind of operations that the Al Qaeda has been carrying out, and uh, I would uh, even go to the extent of saying the kind of footprint they have, which has been expanding over the last twenty odd years, uh, it is as uh, uh, as dangerous, uh, and if not more dangerous, a force as the Islamic State. So, what is is this some kind of a, a cognitive dissonance that? Uh, you know, the Al-Qaeda suddenly seems to not bother anybody and it's all about the Islamic State. Uh, how is this playing out? Well, thank you, Sushant. That's a very important uh, question. And I think you're right that some uh, countries such as Pakistan are trying to make the argument that since ISIS-K is so much worse than the Taliban, the U.S. should be helping the Taliban consolidate its power base um, and fight uh, ISIS-K. Well, look, uh, ISIS-K is an enemy of the United States. Uh, if the U.S. Uh, sees that there's an imminent threat to its own interest and it has an opportunity to, say, take a drone strike against an ISIS-K leader, uh, then the U.S. may choose to do so. But the idea is not to help the Taliban, you know, consolidate its power over the country, because the problem with that is the Taliban is still allied with Al Qaeda. And as I said earlier, Al Qaeda may be lying low, biding its time, but um, I'm pretty sure the Taliban or the Al Qaeda retains its global goals. And this is the problem: the Taliban is still closely allied with Al Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda uh, Al could easily rebuild in the country. So I think the way uh, the United States and others should, should view this situation is, you know, allow 
the Taliban to fight Al Qaeda if that is what it chooses to do. But don't necessarily think that the Taliban is going to be, you know, a partner in uh, countering terrorism because they certainly are not a partner. Uh, so it's it's a complicated situation, but I think there's some merit to what you suggested in terms of allowing ISIS K and Taliban uh, to you know fight it out and just focus on protecting our own CT interests. And if that does involve uh, taking a strike against ISIS K, then by all means the United States should do it. Um, I wanted to raise uh, one other point uh, that I think is important, um, actually two other points, building off some of the previous comments. Kaber talked about Iran and Russia. Um, I'm starting to hear that, yes, Iran is and Iran and Russia are having a bit of buyer's remorse that they had reached out to the Taliban and, you know, even the Russians believe that there was this possibility of the Taliban sharing power with other uh, Afghan leaders, which of course has not panned out. And so they, they both are sort of regretting that they had, uh, you know, supported the Taliban and uh, increased their linkages to the Taliban. So this is something definitely worth watching uh, as the situation moves forward. And lastly, I just wanted to make the point of how important it is for countries like the United States, India, even the European countries, to maintain contacts with the Afghan diaspora, uh, to maintain contacts with the Tajik resistance. I'm not talking about, you know, arming these groups or encouraging a civil war. I'm simply saying uh, that the international community needs to remain in close touch with uh, non-Taliban political leaders to keep that political space open. Um, we partnered with these groups, leaders like Amrullah Saleh in the past, they share our counterterrorism and human rights concerns. So it's certainly in our interest to maintain those close relationships with these leaders. Can I ask, uh, I believe you had a question to ask of Kamran, but before that, can I just ask you a question which uh, my colleague Aditya has put for you? which is that, uh, you know, uh, do you think that the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan can be used as a leverage uh, against the Taliban rather than uh, becoming an excuse for legitimizing the Taliban? Well, look, I think that uh, the international community has an interest in not seeing the Afghans suffer and we should be doing everything we can to avoid a famine in the country, to try to meet the basic needs of the Afghan people. It's not a question of using a humanitarian crisis to do anything. It's a question of meeting the basic needs of the Afghans and preventing uh, a humanitarian catastrophe in the country. So I really think that the, the focus just needs to be on how you get the aid to the people who need it without you know lining the pockets of the Taliban. It may not be a perfect um, system that we uh, get in place. Uh, there may be some slippage, some, you know, of the assistance goes to some Taliban leaders, but every effort should be made to try to get it directly through the humanitarian organizations. And as I indicated before, I think that's possible. And the so question that I want to yeah, oh, go, go go ask the question and Kamran, then I believe uh, Dr. D'Souza also had a question for you. So after uh, Dr. Curtis, Dr. D'Souza can ask and then please feel free to answer. it. Yeah. So Kamran, you made the point that Pakistan is trying to pull the Taliban toward pragmatism. Um, but I just I have to wonder if this is actually the case, because if so, why are they promoting the Haqqanis and demoting more moderate Taliban leaders like um, berater. Uh, you know, it, 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 I just fear that Pakistan's idea of pragmatism is a lot different than the rest of the region or the United States uh, version of pragmatism. Shanti, you had a question also, I believe, uh, of Kamran. Yeah. Uh, my question fundamentally is about the Pakistan's uh, view of uh, having a strong and Taliban uh, in terms of the radical Haqqani network. Is it the objective of Pakistan to see only radical and strong elements of the Taliban insurgency there? Or it, does it want to see a weak uh, 
a state in Afghanistan, in which case it would always encourage some kind of factionalism and ensure that the Taliban doesn't have that control and consolidation of power and territory as it has now, because there are serious concerns of what it means for the TTP and also what it means in terms of the Duran line. And the larger question of what happened in the 1990s when Taliban were in actual control of power, they didn't concede to a lot of Pakistani demands. So my question fundamentally is whether the Pakistan wants a strong uh, Taliban or the radical elements there, or it will continue a stalemate situation where there's factionism and this plays out at, uh, in, an, in a way which is very negative in terms of peace. Kamran, you have three minutes because then I have a question of Dr. Gistosi. Sure, thank you. Those, those are great questions and they're actually related. So uh, let me uh, start with Lisa's point. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. The definitions of what pragmatic means are really different. Uh, for the Pakistanis, uh, pragmatism means whatever you do, do it on your side of the border. Don't make problems for us. And, uh, you know, uh, it, we, we need to do business with the, uh, with the United States. So don't complicate that either. So whatever happens, keep it within your borders. And that's it. And that's sort of the definition of pragmatism. And if you want us, the Pakistani is basically saying to the Taliban, if you want us to help you and mediate for you or lobby for you in the international community, then you're going to have to give us something uh, that shows that you're not uh, you're, you're, you're on that pragmatic path, loosely speaking. So, yes, there is there, there's obviously not uh, the, the the definition is different. You're absolutely right. They're empowering the, the Haqqanis. And this is the problem, is that uh, Pakistan does not have control over this. So they will want the, to exploit that factionalism to make sure their people are, are there. And this leads me to, to uh, uh, Shanti's point, which is that does Pakistan want a strong Taliban state? Well, again, you know, the, the problem is uh, if it becomes too strong, then there's blowback on this side of the border. Again, how do you maintain your Islamic Republic next door to an, a thriving Islamic emirate? Uh, but on the other hand, if the Taliban become too weak, then their opponents will come back to, uh, you know, can challenge them. And if there's infighting, too much infighting, and there's a humanitarian crisis, uh, then, you know, we can see people shifting sides. Mind you, the Taliban were able to run through you know these cities in in nine days in august because people joined them people saw which way the wind was blowing and it's only a matter of time when that wind starts to blow in the opposite direction and so we saw this when within two months uh, after the united states began bombing post 9 11 that both kabul and kandahar fell and because it, it the the circumstances you know basically steered the population towards uh, against the Taliban. So this is the Pakistani challenge. How do you make sure the Taliban do not become too strong to where they threaten Pakistan, but not too weak to where uh, they could become challenged in their own uh, country? And I don't think there's a solution to that. Shanti, you have a question to Dr. Gistosi because after you, I'll ask him the question and then we'll wind it up. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was an excellent pres presentation on the ISK uh, activities in Afghanistan. My question is, ha are there any linkages between the Taliban and ISK? And if they are, how are they supposed to fight out each other and how will it play out on the field? And uh, Dr. Gustosi, my question is, uh, you know, you spoke about uh, the IS presence, for example, in Turkey, in other parts of uh, the world. Uh, what is the possibility of Afghanistan eventually uh, becoming a sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, for want of a better way of putting it, uh, Raqqa being, uh, you know, uh, transplanted in Afghanistan? Uh, simply because after the American withdrawal, I would imagine if I was a jihadist, I would think that Afghanistan is the safest of safe havens in the world. Because no powerful country is going to go back into Afghanistan. So if I have to operate and I have to set up my, you know, a central outfit in a manner of speaking, uh, the go-to place for me would be Afghanistan. Uh, what do you think is the possibility of that happening uh, going forward? 
Well, um, so the answer to the first question, the there have been certain in the past uh, uh, elements of the Taliban, in particular the Akhanis, who have been <clears throat> cooperating with the Islamic State and significant numbers of Akhanis joining the Islamic State, especially uh, that's how the Islamic State acquired capabilities in Kabul originally, uh, but also uh, elsewhere. And uh, my sense is that this collaboration is not going very well right now because the Khan is now are essentially responsible for securing Kabul. So any attack happening in Kabul is also hurting the Khan. It's not only physically, and the Khan is, did take casualties on the Islamic State in Kabul, but also, if you like, in terms of image, you know, the, the Khan is are trying to essentially uh, take over the Emirate on the basis of, of their a reputation for being efficient, well organized, capable, compared to the southern Taliban. But if they can secure Kabul, that of course becomes questionable. So certainly they don't like this, and I think more in general, um, they know that the Islamic State in Khorasan, you know, this kind of friendship uh, that was there, uh, is an obstacle now to the consolidation of a kind of influence within the Emirate is something that clearly is incompatible with their aim of expanding their appeal, up to more and more Taliban networks, and eventually become the dominant force um, uh, within the within the Emirate, which is you know their medium or long term aim. Uh, and, and that's why they haven't completely uh, bailed out. So whereas, for example, in 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 August September. Many members of Lashkar Taiba who joined the Islamic State deserted. Uh, they went back to Lashkar Taiba, and that was seen locally as a sign that the Pakistanis were losing interest in the in the Islamic State as a proxy. The Akhanis still have a, a strong presence within it, so they haven't pulled out. Uh, and I think you know the reason is that they can still see the Islamic State as a useful tool in their. Uh, you know, uh, power struggles within the Taliban is is, is a kind of uh, gives them options basically. You know, and there were reports from people within the Taliban that in uh, in second half of August, early September, in this verbal clash that were taking place over the formation of the caretaker government, etc., uh, Sirajuddin Khan in the meetings threatened, you know. I, I quit and I, I joined the Islamic State. N not that I think he's very serious about doing that, you know, but having that Islamic State there in presence uh, is useful for him because he strengthens his position vis-a-vis -vis the southern leadership, which is very strong still, you know. So, you know, in reality, the Akhanis are not overrepresented in the caretaker government. They're there, but actually their representation is just barely fair. The people who are overrepresented in the cabinet are the Kandahari Taliban, no? not the others. So this power struggle is still going on. The Akhanis are far from having won it. You know, they gain positions, they are gaining influence, but they haven't won it, and it will take quite some time for them winning it. I think also, if the Akhani had to essentially destroy the Islamic State by pulling the people out and uh, agreeing to a decisive military campaign against it, they wouldn't do it until they are in control. You know, so basically that would be the ticket to to the leadership. If they could destroy the Islamic State, uh, that would be the kind of, you know, uh, the thing that can, the kind of thing they do when they believe that this is gonna benefit them, not benefit the kind of leadership. So I think for now they maintain some strategic ambiguity, if you like, with regard to the Islamic State, but I think the relationship is being uh, deteriorating. And then with regard to this, this the Raqqa question, um, I think that was actually the plan originally of the Islamic State when they thought, you know, that the, the wind was blowing their way. That was the idea, you know, and there were talks of uh, eventually, especially as, as things in the Middle East started going very badly, that the liturgy would relocate. At some point, they started sending quite senior people for a period. Uh, but of course, then uh, they had this string of defeats at the end of the Taliban. And the idea of, of being able to establish a viable stronghold or safe haven in the East basically was not credible anymore. And they were also taking a lot of casualties from American airstrikes. You know, basically the leadership was uh, wiped out several times over, which is not really 
uh, that didn't really make the a safe haven in Afghanistan very attractive for for their leaders. So I think um, they uh, they had a lot of discussion. They, they identified Hunar, Nuristan, especially the wooded areas of these uh, provinces as a potential safe haven. But essentially, with the Emirate around, you know, the Emirate now, the Taliban have quite a substantial, hardcore, very skilled light infantry units, very capable. You know, they've taken Panjshir in a week, you know, they, 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 it took the Soviets uh, several years just to take Panjshir and then they had to abandon it again. So, I mean, you know, they're, 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 they are, you know, they took 20 years, 20 years of fighting the American armed forces makes you either dead or quite, quite capable. And clearly they're not dead, so they become quite capable. So I, I think they, um, the Islamic State knows that the Taliban are a big hurdle, they cannot be defeated on the battlefield, uh, but they're trying to generate an internal crisis, hoping that they will implode, or even that other uh, organizations and groups will arm themselves and then create a more complex environment for the Taliban to navigate and prevent them from concentrating forces against the Islamic State. Uh, for now, I think the idea of relocating the headquarters of the Islamic State to eastern Afghanistan is not a viable option. It's a long way before that can happen. Uh, you know, I really wish we could have carried on for another couple of hours. Uh, and I think we could very easily have carried on for another couple of hours uh, because uh, this was just actually getting uh, heated up this uh, uh, talk, uh, but I'm sure we will get together again. And I I can't thank all my panelists enough, Dr. Curtis, Dr. Gustosi, Kamran, Kabir, and Dr. D'Souza. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for joining in. And uh, I think it was a fabulous discussion. Uh, we must have many more of these going forward. Uh, but for now, we have to end out here. Thanks a lot.